Her rhymes were sleek and powerful. She was designed to kill, to seek out and destroy an enemy bomber. She was the most advanced, the most sophisticated weapon of war conceived and built in Canada. She was the Arrow. On a February day in 1959, the Conservative government of John Diefenbaker cancelled the Arrow program after five of the aircraft had slowed. Today there are no Arrows. And there is film of the Arrow in flight, smuggled out of the Avro aircraft plant near Toronto in defiance of a government order to destroy not just the plane, but seemingly all evidence of its existence. Why did the government wish to eradicate its memory? The tragedy of the Arrow, like so many tragedies, began in hope and optimism. At the end of the war, Canada was in a position to become one of the world's leading manufacturers of aircraft. The A.V. Rowe Company, formed in 1945, was a symbol of faith in the future. We had been building Lancaster bombers for war. Now we would build both commercial aircraft for peace and fighters to protect the peace. The architects of this policy were a canny Canadian cabinet minister, C.D. Howe, and directors of the British aircraft firm, Hawker Sibley. Among them, Sir Roy Dobson, the hard driving Lancashireman who had virtually created the Lancaster bomber and who now became Avro's first president. The company's first general manager, here on the right, was an impatient young Canadian, Fred Smy. Avro brought together a talented team of young designers and engineers, many of them from England, like James Foy. The age of the jet was beginning. But before the tragedy of the Arrow could unfold, another disaster was in the making. In 1946, the company embarked on its first project, a four-engine passenger jet which they hoped to sell to Trans-Canada Airlines, later known as Air Canada. TCA was intrigued by the idea of being the first North American airline to offer a jet service, intrigued and perhaps frightened. The company tried to market the plane in the United States. There was a triumphant publicity flight to New York, carrying the world's first jet airmail, and the New York Times said, Uncle Sam has no monopoly on genius. Now, National Airlines ordered four of the aircraft, with an option on a further six. The Korean War had started, and C.D. Howe ordered Avro to put his whole production effort behind a new fighter for the RCAF. Howard Hughes leased the plane for six months and used it as a personal toy. In 1957, the same year Boeing captured the market with its 707, the jetliner was broken up into scrap. Between the jetliner and the Arrow, there was one success story, the CF-100. In 1949, Avro had begun work on a new fighter. The National Film Board chronicled its birth in screaming jets. Behind locked doors, Avro Canada worked to fill a top priority order from the Air Force. And now the reps are coming off Canada's hush-hush night fighter, the CF-100. The CF-100 was a twin-engine, two-man, day-and-night fighter, the first built in Canada to the RCAF's own specifications. It was eventually to be powered by the company's own Arenda engines. With the failure of the jetliner, Avro were now dependent entirely on military contracts, and the stakes were high. In the expectant stillness of the hangar, the men who built the plane are tense with excitement. Each man wonders, had they miscalculated somewhere, or will it scorch off beautifully into the sky?
behind that sleek black question mark lay years of hard work and headaches for all of us. And there were a few headaches to come. In 1951, the CF-100 was still a long way from its successful future. But it did bring into the company a handful of brilliant test pilots. Spud Potocki, a Polish air ace. Peter Cope, from Gloucester Aircraft in England. Jack Woodman with the RCAF, who came later. And Jan Zarakowski. These were to be the only four men to fly the Arrow. Zarakowski could make the CF-100 do cartwheels in the air. And one day, the Eden pushed it into a supersonic dive. But in 1951, another man was to have an impact on the fortunes of Avro and the Arrow. Crawford Gordon had been a protege of C.D. Howes. At the age of 37, he came to the company as president and general manager. Together with Sir Roy Dobson, he built A.V. Rowe into a complex of 39 companies. To Sir Roy, he was like another son a son he would eventually disown. After Gordon's arrival, the CF-100 entered squadron service with the RCAF. Ultimately, Avro produced nearly 700 of them. But already the Air Force knew it needed something that would fly higher and faster to keep pace with the new Russian bombers. And in that knowledge was born the Arrow. In 1952, Avro came up with design studies for a new double wing aircraft. The CF-105 was to be a supersonic twin engine capable of engaging the enemy at 50,000 feet and carrying missiles and rockets. It was a whole new concept in fighter technology and it pushed Avro's design team into finding solutions to problems never faced before. Jim Floyd was now Vice President of Engineering in charge of the overall design of the plane. Problems were legion on the Arrow. We had a problem, for instance, that the wing skin temperatures at 50,000 feet, where the aircraft was to have its combat capability, were 40, 50 degrees higher than the boiling point of water. Yet inside of the wing, you had the fuel, which was cooling it down. So the differential temperature was trying to distort the wing. And we had to tailor and design the wing so that that distortion was compensated and didn't affect the aerodynamic capability of the aircraft. There were to be no prototypes. Avra was going straight into a first batch of pre-production models, and testing was elaborate. Scale models were fired by rocket into Lake Ontario to test aerodynamic qualities. The CF-105 was now called the Arrow. We had to be dead right first time. There was no flying a prototype, finding the problems on it, then reflecting the, that back into the production drawings and issuing modifications. You had to be right, and yet you had nothing to fall back on, no real experience to fall back on, on the design of this aircraft. As the program developed, there were some unanswered questions that were to have a crucial bearing on the Arrow's fate. The RCAF had not completed studies on the weapon they wanted the plane to carry. Robert Lindley, chief technician, came up with an unusual solution. Uh, one feature of the uh, Arrow, the uh, weapon bay, you may recall that the whole weapon bay would lower out of the airplane and go back in again. And I put that feature in there because I couldn't find out what weapon we were supposed to be carrying. So I said, okay, I'll solve the problem, you know, I'll make a detachable portion. And take your time, make up your mind. When you're ready, we'll put it in there. And uh, it was a nifty feature, I guess, in the end, but uh, that's really why it was done. While Lindley was coping with the unknown weapon system, the arrow began to take shape on the factory floor. A workforce of some 14,000 men and women translated the engineering drawings into a reality of steel, aluminum, titanium, and miles of electric wire. The Liberal government of Louis Saint-Laurent began to notice the mounting costs. In mid-1955, C.D. Howe told the House, We have embarked on a program of development that gives me the shudders. The RCAF had now decided it wanted the Sparrow missile and the Astra fire control system, neither of them yet off the drawing boards in the United States. The Air Force wanted the best, and it was going to cost the country dearly. But it was not the Liberals who were going to pay the bill. 
In June 1957, John Diefenbaker became Prime Minister of Canada at the head of a Conservative government. And suddenly, Avro, created by the Liberals, found itself without friends in Ottawa. The Arrow was already a financial problem. Now, with hundreds of subcontractors dependent on the program, making everything from landing gear to delicate flight instruments, and with thousands of employees on the payroll, it was a political problem. On October the 4th, 1957, the Arrow made its first public appearance before an audience of dignitaries, Air Force officials and workers. The Honorable George Perks, Minister of Defense in the new Conservative government, told his listeners that the coming missile age did not mean that the era of the manned airplane was over. The aircraft, he said, has this one great advantage over the missile. It can bring the judgment of a man into the battle. The argument which Perks dismissed was within months to be used against the Arrow by his own Prime Minister. But on that day, the builders of the Arrow were counting the months and the weeks ahead until it should take flight. I understand the Arrow will undergo high-speed taxiing tests within the next uh, three weeks, but when will it fly? It will fly uh, sometime during the period that it's undergoing these high-speed ta speed taxi trials. Uh, you say within the next three weeks, this is when we would hope it will uh, be doing its high-speed trials. And sometime uh, during that period, it will fly. And it did fly. On the 25th of March, 1958, Jan Zurakowski climbed into the cockpit of Arrow 201. He made a final instrument check, pressed open the throttles, and released the brakes. The Arrow was ready for takeoff. Okay. I am coming in to take photographs. Stand by it. Every maneuver of the plane was recorded by cameras on the ground and in the two chase planes, piloted by Jack Woodman and Spud Potocki. Controls are behaving quite nicely. I can see no oscillatory motions of any description in them. I think all this uh, immediate and the carriage is that the whole derivation disappears. I think and the carriage is making this. That's right, it's the side door which is making, the door which comes and closes the undercarriage in the way. In flight, the arrow performed like the thoroughbred she clearly was. All the attention to detail, all the elaborate test procedures of the past five years, paid off in a flight that was virtually flawless. Uh, I'll be accelerating up to 250 now. Roger. In the laconic voices of Zorakowski and his countryman Spud Potocki, veterans of the Polish Air Force in Britain 13 years before, you hear the routine communication of two professionals examining the behavior of a piece of machinery as if this test flight were the most normal event in the world. The engines are behaving quite nicely. They are occasionally giving you a, a, a bit of a black puff of smoke uh, coming out of the Mian, but otherwise I can see there is no problem. That is Roger Jan, as far as I can see from the back, no condition has changed. Uh, switching out the dumpers now. Two innings, please, 201. The wind is northeast at 10, the altimeter is 0, two, zero. Number... On that first flight of 35 minutes, Zorakowski took the plane to 11,000 feet. On succeeding flights, it was to reach easily its target of 50,000 feet at nearly twice the speed of sound. Workers, managers and Air Force personnel left their shops and offices to watch the return of Arrow 201. Some had even bought their families. But there was something else. 
Canadians, used to seeing the leadership in technology in the hands of the United States and Britain, were suddenly aware that they had something which looked like the best in the world. And when Zora came down after this flight of this super airplane and the snag sheet showed the malfunction of two electrical switches out of 4,000 or thereabouts, we weren't surprised. I'm not, you know, I don't want to feel any arrogance about this, but the facts are we had done so much testing because of going straight into production that we had to be right. It was just unthinkable that, that anything could go radically wrong with that aircraft. And it was a very, very successful flight. But the first flight uh, was uh, very simple and very easy. From flying point of view, it didn't present any, any problems. You know, Zurichowski never told you what the hell went on when you, you uh, got him to fly an airplane. Because he, uh, he flew them for himself, I think, not for, for you. But uh, he was uh, certainly a superb pilot, there's no question about it. Reg Lane was a group captain in the RCAF attached to the Avro plant and the Aero program. He retired as Brigadier General Lane, Deputy Commander of NORAD at Colorado Springs. He was one of the spectators in that crowd on the edge of the runway. It was absolutely magnificent when that aircraft flew the first time and the reports that were coming back from the test pilot and the various readouts of the test equipment that was on, on board the aircraft of the performance of the total machine. And of course it was, I think it was a second or third flight, I can't remember precisely when it actually went through Mach 1. Now that was a truly incredible accomplishment and in those, in those days and uh, at that stage of the design of modern jet airplanes. Truly phenomenal effort. Well, of course, uh, everyone's spirits just rocketed when the initial reports came through on the first test flight of the airplane. And uh, we knew that we had a winner. It was a, a fantastic performing aircraft. I mean, Avro's commitment was to build an airplane that would give the Air Force 1.5 mark. Our performance boys thought we could do 1.6 mark with it. As it turned out, we actually flew that airplane to 1.9 mark number. And uh, had we continued the development of the Iroquois engine, uh, the Iroquois engine powered airplane, we had a lighter engine for more thrust, and we had a 2.3, 2.4 mark number potential. In 1958, there wasn't another airplane in the world that was any near, anywhere near being competitive with this airplane. The project was just on a, had a lot of national pride. You know, you, you, you just go home at night and, and uh, people want to hear about it, and you tell them about it. I remember Bob Rice had a garage down the road from the airport. And he used to call me, I was taking off today, and I'd say, yeah, take what time? i said, say, oh, I don't know, probably about 10 o'clock. And he'd be out in front of the garage with his people, he wouldn't serve anybody, no gas, waiting for the airplane to take off and go over to the gas station. For the airplane, that's what everybody wanted, you know. It was something they could look at and say, hey, that's what we did in this country, and I think it was terrific. Through the summer of 1958, Arrows 201, 202, and 203 chalked up 57 flights, totaling some 61 hours. Each flight provided valuable lessons about the plane's capabilities. 204 made six flights beginning in October, and 205 flew only once on the 11th of January, 1959. But by that time, the Arrow was already under sentence of death. <laughs> 